This is the recent interview with Nick Gillespie. Today's episode is sponsored by The Dispatch, your source for unbiased news and commentary informed by conservative principles. Is Donald Trump really going to jail? Does Joe Biden really have what it takes for a second term? Do these questions even matter in the 2024 U.S. election? Get past the bluster and get back to the facts by joining The Dispatch. The Dispatch provides original reporting and commentary on politics, policy, and culture, and it's all informed by conservative principles. Their newsletters and podcasts offer fact-based analysis to help members make sense of the biggest domestic and international stories of the day. The Dispatch has created a home for the politically homeless and provides a needed and welcome sense of humor as their writers explain the news. Reason listeners can try an exclusive 30-day free trial membership. Just click the link in the show notes to join the Dispatch today. My guest today is Eric Brakey, the new executive director of the Free State Project, a nonprofit that since 2001 has been working to get small government diehards to move to New Hampshire and make the Granite State a stronghold for libertarian ideas. Prior to becoming head of the Free State Project, Brakey was a Republican state senator in Maine, where he authored successful legislation that expanded gun rights, legalized over-the-counter birth control, and enacted right-to-try legislation. We talk about the state of the libertarian movement, how Ron Paul and Young Americans for Liberty shaped his worldview, and how he hopes to concentrate what he calls the libertarian diaspora in New Hampshire. Here is The Reason Interview with Eric Brakey. Eric Brakey, thanks for talking to Reason. Nick, it's a real pleasure. I listen to uh, your shows and The Reason Roundtable every Mm -hmm. week. Well, thank you for that. Um, You are the new executive director of the Free State Project. Tell us about the state of the Free State Project. Well, the Free State Project has been going for over two decades now. So I'd like to say we're at the start of the second generation. And for those who aren't familiar with it, it's basically it's a mass migration movement of libertarians recognizing, you know, as people who love liberty, uh, there are millions of us, but we're scattered around the country. You call it the libertarian diaspora, which I like a lot. (laughs) Right. uh, You know, this, this country that was founded on these ideals, right? You know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, limited government. Uh, be free to live your life as you choose, so long as you're not hurting other people. Um, Our country has really kind of lost sight of that a lot um, uh, in both our politics and our culture. And libertarians out there, maybe in any particular space, we might be 1% to 5% of the voting population. Um, But that's not really enough to have a real significant impact on the politics and the culture in, in kind of localized areas. And so the Free State Project is just the idea that was originated by our founder, Jason Sorens. What if libertarians picked a spot and we concentrated people there and we had a real impact on the politics and the culture. And uh, the Live Free or Die State in New Hampshire was uh, was picked by early participants in the program. Part of me as a uh, someone who loves Maine, I know that Maine was a contender at one point. I wish partly it had it was Maine, but New Hampshire was a natural fit. You know, there's a strong libertarian ethic there. And um, over the course of 20 years now, thousands of people have made the move, joining native Granite Staters who love, love liberty. How many, how many people have signed the pledge to move to New Hampshire? So, yeah, initially there was this push to get to 20,000 right. people. And once 20,000 people signed the pledge, that would trigger the move and people would, would move on out. Um, that, and that, that was reached, what, like in 2018, I think? Uh, that sounds about right. Yeah. Somewhere in that time okay. frame. So how many, so you, you don't do the, the pledge anymore? We don't do the pledge okay. anymore so much. Uh, we document that um, not everyone who's pledged has made the move, though some people are still saying, you know, when my kids are finally right, out of school yeah. and, you know, they're going on their own time. Um, but we do know for a fact that at least 7,000 people that we can document have made the move. And then there's also a lot of libertarians who don't like to end up on lists. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. So they make the move and right? maybe they pop up a few years later. So we, what, we what have been, you know, let's start with the politics of New Hampshire. So there's like 7,000 free staters or, or 7,000 people who have moved to 
New Hampshire as part of the Free State Project. What are you know what are the top two or three political wins that the Free State Project has done in New Hampshire? Yeah, if we're just looking in the realm of the politics, yeah, yeah, many, and then we'll talk right, about culture in a right. second. Right, many Free Staters run for the uh, the State House of Representatives. You only have to be in New Hampshire two years to run, and there's 400 members. So, uh, like every neighborhood has its own state representative almost. Um, and libertarians, primarily running as registered Republicans, now account for uh, about a quarter of the House of Representatives and a majority of the majority Republican caucus. Uh, the majority leader is a, is a free stater. Um, and um, from that, we've seen New Hampshire leading the way on school choice policies with education freedom accounts where money follows the child. New Hampshire is one of the first states to uh, have that in place. Um, uh, New Hampshire was one of the original constitutional carry states, though I like to brag in Maine, we got it just a tad before. And you, I played uh, my we'll role in we'll that. talk about your career. You are leaving the Maine uh, Senate in order to become the head of the Free State Project, but you know, Maine is in the rearview mirror for you, man, okay? <laughs> yeah, I still like yeah. to brag about the accomplishments there. But I will say in New Hampshire, one of the things I'm particularly proud of right now watching um, is that the New Hampshire House of Representatives just became the first lower chamber in the country to pass defend the guard legislation. Yeah, okay, talk about this, because this I find is a fascinating idea um, that everybody I've mentioned it to is like, oh, that's a great idea. Explain what defend the guard is. Right, so with the foreign policy of our country, right, uh, the, the, the state national guards are, you know, have, have evolved over time out of the, the original militias. And in our constitution, they still answer to the states, except for in three circumstances, to suppress insurrection, repel invasion, enforce the laws of the union. Um, that's, those are the circumstances under which Congress can deploy them. But you, look, but you look at the Middle East wars of the last 20 years, and National Guard troops count for about 50% of troops on the ground in these wars. And yet you look at the occupation of Syria, are we suppressing an insurrection? Actually, the purpose was to foment an insurrection over there. Are we repelling an invasion? Well, we kind of are the invasion. Are we enforcing the, any law of the union? There's no declaration of war. There isn't an, even a congressional AUMF for Syria. And so uh, it's illegal for our National Guard troops to be over there unless the states are tacitly consenting to it. So Defend the Guard just has legislatures, state legislatures stand up and say, unless Congress does their job, and votes to declare war, you are not authorized to take our National Guard troops and send them overseas. Really, we're just asking for the constitutional minimum, which is just Congress needs to go on record and vote on it so they can be held accountable yeah. by our democratic processes. Would, with Defend the Guard legislation, would an authorization of the use of military force be enough? No, it wouldn't. Okay, it would have to be, to be a an declaration, declaration of war. Um, when will the upper chamber in New Hampshire and the governor sign Defend the Guard, or is that, a, is that up for grabs? Yeah, so not this go around. Uh, they kind of uh, punted on it in the Senate, but we kind of expected it as much. Um, I think it's gonna, you know, it's a free state project and the Liberty hasn't all fully matriculated up to the, the, right. the, the state Senate there yet. So it's uh, trickle up uh, Liberty, <laughs> right? Trickle well, up you Defend have, the Guard. You have to be in the state two years to run for the yeah. House, but seven years to run for the Senate. Oh, I see. So okay, yeah. the day is coming. <laughs> um, the, um, you know, for the culture of freedom in uh, New Hampshire, how has the Free State Project affected that? Well, and, and I will say, as far as the culture, this is something that kind of almost has to be kind of experienced and seen to fully understand it. As you've seen when you've come to the Porcupine Freedom Festival, which is coming up next June, and we still have tickets available for any who would like to uh, grab one at porkfest.com. Um, that's pork with a C, not a yes. K. Yes, um, because it's short for porcupine. Yes, the Porcupine yeah. Freedom Festival. But um, there is a real effect when you get thousands of people li who love liberty in one place, right? And, and um uh, there's a networking effect, right? People form all kinds of different communities. Um, uh, so, you know, you love liberty, but we don't just want to just all sit around and talk about Murray Rothbard all the time. Like that gets pretty tiring and boring. We'll leave that to people on Twitter. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't want uh, X, X. We'll leave that to people on X. Um, but we have entire homeschool co-op uh, networks. We have um, uh, people who are, you know, into agorism or, or, or outdoorsmanship or, you know, 
knitting groups, whatever your interest is outside of, of, liber, of libertarianism itself, because we have so many people concentrated in one place, if you want to be in community with people who share other interests with you but also don't want to sick the government against you uh, because they don't agree with decisions you make in your life or how you spend your money, um, then that's um, then that's something that really uniquely is kind of being fostered yeah. in in New Hampshire. What are your priorities as the you know the the new head of the Free State Project? Like, are there particular goals or particular initiatives that you're interested in pushing? Um, you know, there's still so many people out there in the libertarian diaspora who don't know about the work of the Free State Project. Then we're building a homeland for liberty in New Hampshire, and uh, maybe not everyone is ready to make the move tomorrow. But we want people to know, and I want people to know, that when they finally get to that breaking point, when the next COVID tyranny or whatever the next iteration of, of that tyrannical moment is where you realize that you and your family can't stay in California anymore, um, um, we want people to know that we're building something in New Hampshire and they're welcome to come and join us. So, Where do most of the people come from when they move from somewhere? Where Are they, are, is, are they coming from Massachusetts? Or are they coming from... California, you know, you know, obviously it's easier for people to move from from nearby. I mean, I meet people who leave, you know, in freedom in the 50 states. New Hampshire was ranked number one for freedom. New York was ranked number 50. Yeah. I'm sorry. I know that's the uh, state uh, you, uh, you know and love. Yeah. Well, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so we get a lot of New Yorkers um, who uh, it's a major upgrade to go from the Empire State to the Free State. But people really come from all over. I uh, I was just on the phone yesterday. We have a calling, we do regular calling parties, volunteers calling people who've expressed interest in the Free State Project. Uh, I just called a person yesterday who, when I called him, he said he was uh, he was in California. I, he was in the process of packing up all his things and renting a U-Haul and, and, and coming to New Hampshire. And when he arrives, he's going to find a welcome wagon of Free Staters there to help him unpack his U-Haul and move into his And he'll home. probably uh, pull a gun on you, right? And be like, how did you know I was coming? <laughs> Well, we communicate but, yeah. uh, along um, the way. Why do you think, uh, you know, and this, this goes to the concept that Jason Sorens came up with, which I, you know, I remember when that happened. And it was kind of like, I, when I read it, I, it was kind of like when you read the, the Bitcoin white paper for the first time. It's like, okay, this is smart. This is really something. More people move to places like Texas and Florida, which are, you know, certainly better in terms of kind of most forms of freedom, uh, certainly economic freedom than New York or California, but like they're, you know, why do you think people go to places like Texas and Florida in, you know, the hundreds of thousands um, as opposed to the Free State Project? Well, I will say, we, you know, we did see a huge influx into New Hampshire during COVID from from folks, but certainly um, uh, Florida and Texas, you, you, you see a lot more of that and certainly they grab the headlines. Um, and of course, I think it is interesting to see overall this kind of sorting that's happening in America. COVID was a big moment where people realized, you know, the state you live in really matters. Um, uh, you know, when I would go back and visit Maine, because um, I was working in Texas uh, at Young Americans for Liberty during during a lot of that, it was like stepping into a different country where people were, um, that where the degree of freedom that people were experiencing was very, very different. Um, you know, um, I will say for Texas and Florida, they are, they're pretty good on economic freedom, but on personal freedom, they're not so great. Um, so if you're just a conservative and you don't care about personal freedom, you just want to keep the money that you earn, and, but you want to boss people around in their bedrooms and, and what they do in their personal lives, I guess Texas or Florida might be a match for you. I think a lot of conservatives like that. But that's not how I want to live. I, I don't, and if you want, if you want freedom in the real sense, freedom in your personal life, freedom in your economic life. That's what we're building in New Hampshire and hope more people will come and join how, us. How hard, you know, people always talk about, uh, you know, libertarians, it's like herding cats, the Free State Project. I mean, you are dragging, you know, you're trailing fish bones and bringing all kinds of cats in. Uh, last year, you got rid of one, of, and this would have been before your time, but you, you, you know, the Free State Project kind of kicked out Jeremy Kaufman, who's also affiliated with the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire, which has one of the most kind of rancorous and foul Twitter feeds of LP groups. How, my question is, how do you, you know, what are the parameters you draw to say, okay, you know what, like we, are, we accept everybody, but not you? 
how do you, how do you keep it together so that liberty looks and smells pretty good? Well, first I'll say uh, Jeremy has been nothing but respectful to me since I've come in, and he's given me. I've sat down, had coffee with him. He's given me kind of good advice on things, and and I respect him as a member of the, of the free state movement, which is of course larger than the organization itself. Um, you know, I think our perspective, to some degree, within the free state project is libertarianism is a thin philosophy, right? It's don't hurt people, don't take their stuff. And uh, within that, you know, people, there's a lot of different iterations of what people uh, supplement that with in terms of their larger philosophies. I'm informed by Stoicism and Taoism and all sorts of things. Um, So with the Free State Project, our job is to outreach to people and help them move and relocate and get here. And then once they get here, It's a decentralized movement. People are going to do with the opportunity to be in the Liberty homeland um, what they want with it. Um, And again, some people went out and developed cryptocurrencies and fostered Bitcoin to become the powerhouse it is today. Some people started homeschooling co-ops. Some people just wanted to start rucking groups or whatever you want to make of it. You know, some people run for the legislature, whatever you want to make of it, that's on you. And the human resources, the liberty human resources are there to find great people to collaborate with. And so I'm, we're not really trying to kind of gatekeep and say, oh, you're not the right kind of libertarian. We don't want but you. But you do for the, mo- for the Free State Project hierarchy, right? Well, certainly it's, yeah. an, organi- it's, it's an organization with a board of directors and, and, um, and the board kind of makes decisions on how do some you of those things. F- how do you feel about the, you know, there's a lot, uh, the libertarian movement, um, simultaneously seem, you know, it's very active, but it's also very fractious right now. And, you know, I guess it always has been, but you have, you know, we're not a few weeks away, not only from Pork Fest, but from the Libertarian Party uh, National Convention, uh, where a couple of years ago, the Mises Caucus took over. And, there, you know, it seems by most uh, reporting, you know, that membership is down and donations are down. Um, there's a lot of tension between groups like Cato and Reason and various other groups. Um, do you feel like the libertarian movement is at a uh, you know is at each other's throats? And if so, how does you know how do how do we address that, or should we bother addressing it? Well, I, I I think we could all do to extend a little bit more grace to each other. I tend to be a big tent libertarian. Um, probably the only thing I don't really tolerate is you know people who want to wage war. <laughs> um, that's, that's been kind of a, a hard line for me. But um, I mean, you know, as far as kind of the internal workings of the Libertarian Party and what's going on there, I can't speak too much on that. You know, I'm a registered Republican, so I'm not, I don't have my finger on the pulse of all that. But, um, but I will say, you know, it was, it was disappointing uh, back during COVID watching the previous leadership of the Libertarian Party not really take a, a, a stronger stand on there. And that created the opening for the Mises Caucus to come in with a, a bolder message there. As far as um, the upcoming Libertarian National Convention, I know there's controversy around Donald Trump is coming to speak, as well as Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And there's a lot of perspectives on that. My personal perspective is, um, you know, if we're being honest, None of the libertarian candidates running for president, I'm sure they're all great people and they're philosophically like people I would very much agree with, but we don't, no one really expects that any one of them is going to be the next president of the United States, right? There's an opportunity to spread the message and get some votes. But so I look at it as the opportunity for a thir- the libertarian party as a third party at this point in time is really to demonstrate that here is a voting block that is not committed to the Democrats or the Republicans. And it's a voting block that's big enough to swing the outcome one way or the other. Um, maybe for Robert F. Kennedy Jr., maybe for Donald Trump. Maybe uh, for Joe Biden. Right? Yeah, Joe Biden's not showing I mean, up and, to make his case. Though. Yeah, and if, if, yeah, if, what, what would be, you know, what would you say are the top three things if, you know, let's, let's go with the idea that the libertarian voting block, not the, not the LP per se, but it includes that, but it's obviously bigger than that. Let's say there's, f- you know, that's 5% of the, the voting population and Democrats and Republicans, we know this from every election, basically this, you know, this century, they need every vote they can get. How, do, how, does, how does Joe Biden or Donald Trump get the libertarian vote? Yeah, well, I don't think there's a path for Joe Biden to get it. Yeah. 
I mean, that's just might be my own yeah, bias yeah. as okay. a Republican. So even if he's like, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm going to legal, I'm going to des- actually deschedule weed. <laughs> I'm going to pardon Julian Assange and I'm, go- I'm not going to do any more stimulus spending. You know, hey, it's yeah. some of those are attractive things. Maybe. He has no idea what he's saying. So, like, you know, it's yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, what what are the what are the three? You know, let's say like, what are the three priorities? So, I guess I could speak for myself only. But like, you know, if Donald Trump came to the Libertarian National Convention and he articulated a way to de-escalate kind of this path to World War Three that we're on. Um, if he articulated uh, an actual commitment to have monetary reform around the Federal Reserve, uh, if he uh, uh, made concrete promises to pardon individuals like Ross Ulbricht and Julian Assange and Edward, and Edward Snowden, I mean, that's something. Does that mean that Donald Trump is a libertarian? No, of course not, right? But, um, but if we can use our leverage in these... In, in these um, in these moments to extract concessions from the people who may in fact actually be pr- president. Um, it, you know, I think it goes to something that um, Morton Blackwell, the head of the Leadership Institute, often talk, talks about. He said, we can try to get political change by getting all the right people elected who, who are philosophically with us on everything, but we're going to be waiting a long time for that. Or we can try to shape the political environment around the wrong people to make it politically expedient for them to do the right thing, right? And so to some degree, and I've done this in the legislature, right, when we passed constitutional carry, not everyone who voted for constitutional carry actually thought it was the best idea in the world, but we made sure that they knew that their election prospects depended on it because they heard from their constituents. And I think that uh, libertarians can play a a similar role. We want to play hard to get, not impossible to get. Before we continue with the Reason interview, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Bank on Yourself, a retirement plan alternative. Most of us have been told the only way to have enough money to retire is to put your life savings into a 401k or IRA and then bank on Wall Street. But if that were true, why do studies show the average American who follows that advice will outlive their savings by a staggering 10 years? Get the truth and discover a better way to grow and protect your money. Bank on Yourself is a proven retirement plan alternative that banks and Wall Street are desperately hoping that you never hear about. It gives you guaranteed predictable growth and retirement income. With Bank on Yourself, your plan doesn't go south whenever the markets tumble. You're also in control with Bank on Yourself. You get access to your money for any purpose with no questions asked and no government penalties or restrictions on how much money you can take or when you can take it. You also get peace of mind. You'll know the minimum guaranteed value of your retirement savings on the day you plan to tap into them and at every point along the way. Learn the secret to safely and predictably grow your wealth every single year, enjoy tax-free retirement income, and gain control of your money. Just go to bankonyourself.com slash word, and they'll send you a free report about the retirement plan alternative that lets you bypass banks and Wall Street and take back control of your financial future. That's bankonyourself.com slash word, W-O-R-D, for your free report. Go to bankonyourself.com slash W-O-R-D. And now, back to the Reason interview. Um, let's talk about your uh, legislative history in Maine. Um, how did you end up in Maine? Because you, you grew up in, in Ohio, you went to school there, but you were most recently a state senator from Maine, right? Yeah. Or in Maine. And I'm still finishing up my final okay. term. Um, so, yes, I grew up in Ohio, but my parents are, are na- uh, my parents are originally from Maine. They, uh, uh, it's been a problem in Maine for a long time. We lose our young people because of the lack of job opportunity. Uh, So they moved out to Ohio. We were raised there, came back there every summer. Um, After I graduated from college, I got my BFA in acting and I went to New York City and I was working as a professional actor there. But I got involved with the grassroots Ron Paul campaign back during the Tea Party wave leading up to the 2012 campaign. Um, And uh, that led to people pushing me to apply for a job with the campaign. I thought I wasn't going to do it. I'd spend the last 10 years of my life preparing for to be a professional actor and but it seemed like a moment where um, could make a difference. And so I thought, all right, I'll put my life on pause. I'll come back to New York City later and uh, I'll go 
uh, joined the Ron Paul campaign. They actually want to send me out to Colorado, but I specifically asked for Maine because of my family roots there and my parents had retired up that way. Um, we ended up um, really, it was a big surprise victory that year. We won the state of Maine. We won the delegates to the national convention. I was elected as a delegate um, until the Mitt Romney campaign kicked me out and kicked out a lot of the Ron Paul delegates that year, um, which with some underhanded things, I thought. But um, I learned from that how much of um, a difference we can make if we are organized and we have a plan and we execute that plan because that's what happened in Maine. And so I kept at it, uh, ran for state Senate two years later, defeated a 36 year Democrat incumbent um, and um, passed a number of good liberty policies. While yeah, I was what, there. what are you uh, and obviously the clock is still running on you, but what are what, what are the accomplishments you're most proud of as uh, your time in the state Senate? We're one of the first states to pass constitutional carry. Still, the and oldest. explain that uh, um, you can you can carry a firearm, open or concealed, without a permission slip from the state, as long as you're not a prohibited person and you can legally own the firearm. Um, so we were the sixth state to pass that. Now over half the country has it. Um, Maine was a really important domino, I think, in that process. Why Why is constitutional carry, and I want to talk a little bit about Young Americans for Liberty, where you worked, which is an outgrowth of Ron Paul's presidential campaigns. Why is constitutional carry, or why are gun rights so important in your kind of libertarianism? Yeah, well, I guess, as I see it, um, if you have a society where all the guns are in the hands of the government pointed at the people, that's not gonna be a free society for very much, for very long. Um, you know, our system of checks and balances isn't supposed to be just a system between government agencies. It's supposed to also be a system of checks and balances between the people and the state. And um, I tend to find that those who advocate for gun control aren't really against guns. They want guns in the hands of the government. They just not, don't want them in the hands of us. And I think that's a, 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 I think history shows that's a very dangerous recipe. Yeah. Do you find that that's a, uh, a good uh, way of bringing people into the libertarian tent? Yeah, I mean, I, well, certainly I found <clears throat> in Republican politics in Maine that um, because I'm the guy who passed constitutional carry, many conservative Republicans who maybe don't agree with me when I'm championing medical cannabis and adult use cannabis, they give me a bit of a pass because he's the guy who got our gun rights back or other kind of conservative issues I've led on, welfare reform, things where there's you know that Venn van diagram between kind of conservative issues and libertarian issues intersect. Is there much of a, you know, a, a, with that Venn diagram, do Democrats intersect very much or is your sense that you know, the, the modal Democrat is really just never going to be libertarian. Um, well, I mean, I will say in the Free State Project, you know, in the Free State Movement, we do have a lot of, you know, we have left wing libertarians and, and you'll find them at Porkfest and they're welcome and I'd love to be in community with them. Hey, if you agree that we're not going <laughs> to, you're not going to try to, you know, use aggression against people to achieve your aims, then, hey, we can live together. Um, but I will say, you know, my experience in the legislature is, you know, there are certain issues I've done a lot of work with Democrat legislators on cannabis policy and drug policy, um, on civil liberties issues. Um, I will say that some of the issues that I have found common ground in the past with Democrats, some of those issues I've found in recent years, they've been trending away from. Like what? Um, so I would have thought that I would have found more support from Democrats on Defend the Guard. Um, there were a few progressive Democrats who, who, who stuck with us, you know. Um, but I think something has really happened in the Democratic Party since the uh, election of Donald Trump. And it's, it's like the Hillary Clinton neoliberalism, which seems a lot to me like a, just a left-wing version of neoconservatism, um, has really kind of taken root um, in, in the minds of a lot of folks over there. So I think s some of the best parts about the Democratic Party, I think, are still alive in people like Tulsi Gabbard, who, of course, has left the Democratic Party. But I think that's a... Um, that's a that's a real sign of how the Democratic yeah. Party's been changing. So, um, with uh, constitutional carry, uh, what else was like a highlight for you as an achievement? Um, we did. I, I led uh, in huge reforms of our medical cannabis program to make it more market based um, and uh, sm you know small business focused, so you don't have a f few big businesses coming in and gobbling up all the limited licenses. I think we in Maine Maine has one of the best. Um, uh, can legal cannabis programs in the country. 
Um, I uh, led on passage of Right to Try, uh, which, you know- And explain that for- Yeah, allowing terminally ill patients to try non-FDA approved medications that are still going through early experimental phases. Um, Now it's a national law, but um, uh, that Trump signed into law, but Maine was the first state in New England to adopt it. And when I was on the Republican National Platform Committee in 2016, actually got that in the Republican National Platform just as, and then Republicans kind of took it up in Congress. So it, that seems like such a no-brainer. It's amazing to me that you know it just doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah, and um, I think it's popular because it's common sense. But you still had we we had to go up against the FDA that didn't want right. uh, any any kind of stepping on their turf, and some of the I think some of the legislators who were kind of really deferential to the FDA were uh, had to had to overcome them. But I did find a lot of bipartisan support for it. Um, a lot of Democrats kind of helped us get that across the finish line. Uh, talk a bit about your time at Young Americans for Liberty. This is, a, you know, it's a campus-based group that also does uh, kind of political campaigning for candidates who um, meet the, who sign a, you know, a kind of oath to follow certain types of uh, positions or have a philosophy that's consistent with Ron Paul and, you know, a Ron Paul libertarian vision. Um, how did that affect your thinking or how did you get involved with that? Yeah, um, you know, it's funny. I didn't really, I, I wasn't involved in Young Americans for Liberty when I was in college. I was too busy doing theater uh, to have time for too much politics. Plus, I didn't really, I didn't really come to realize that Ron Paul was right until I was on my way out in my senior year. Uh, but I got involved. Please say now you will never do uh, a one man show of Ron Paul, but. Although that could be good. I, I don't know. I make yeah. no promises. Okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe that'll be my magnum opus, yeah. you know. <laughs> um, so Young Americans for Liberty, I, you know, I do feel like on the national level is one of the most important organizations in the liberty movement. You know, maybe right there next to reason. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, as far as mobilizing um, young people, of course, the Ron Paul movement was fueled by young people who had a thirst for kind of these ideas. Um uh, it's not only, it started as an organization that was having a huge impact on college campuses, but has grown into an organization that is having a huge impact beyond that. Um, there was a realization, actually, it was around, actually, when I ran for the United States Senate, they sent up some Young Americans for Liberty door knockers. Uh, Rand Paul hired them for a super PAC to come door knock for me. And then from out of that, they realized this door knocking thing is really effective. We've got this activist army. What are we going to do with it? And they started a program called Operation Win at the Door, in which they take their uh, their activists and they pay them to go out and knock doors for state legislative candidates, because that's where you can make a, a tremendous difference. Um, and I think they used me a bit, my work in the Maine Senate as a bit of a model for that. Um, and to date, they've elected that they, now when I got elected in 2014, if you were to count up the Ron Paul kind of Republican legislators around the country, you could maybe count to you know, we could count them on two hands if you were being generous. Now there's over 300. Um, and in the in the Young Americans for Liberty Hazlitt Coalition, they call it. And what's encouraging to me um, beyond the sheer numbers of it is the fact that now there is a network across state legislatures of people who are learning from each other's ideas and, and, uh, and legislative attempts. And you can not just change, uh, affect liberty policy within the state itself, but you can also do coordinated nullification efforts across the states to nullify unconstitutional federal laws. The challenge with nullification, like issues like Defend the Guard that we were speaking about, is oftentimes states are afraid to be the first to challenge the federal government because the federal government can be very, um, uh, can bring harsh retribution, threaten to cut off your federal funding for this or that, and that can really paralyze states. But now that we can have coordinated efforts across state capitals, with people who share this Ron Paul libertarian ethic, you can have uh, Defend the Guard being put forward in multiple state capitals all in the same year. And those arguments of, well, we're going to be alone and we're going to be targeted if we do this, it's um, it falls a little flat these days because yep. of what's being built there. Are you optimistic about the uh, 2024 election or you know politics in the short term? It seems, I mean, obviously you're exiting politics per se, uh, you know, as you you head up the Free State Project, but you know, are are we headed in the right direction, or you know, have we yet to bottom out? You know, I, I'm I'm not very confident about 
federal level politics. You know, I've run for federal office twice and I've experienced firsthand that it's a really well fortified citadel of corruption. And uh, they literally have access to a money printing machine <laughs> where they can just drop millions of dollars against you. Yeah, it's amazing because you, when you ran for um, Congress as a, in the Republican primary in 2020, you had backing from Club for Growth and Freedom Works, and you finished third in the primary. Like, yeah, what, I, I mean that doesn't I, compute, right? Yeah, I was the front runner for the entire race, uh, and then um, a few things happened. Well, COVID happened. Our strategy was built a lot on door knocking. <laughs> and suddenly, if you were sending door knockers uh, out, you were killing grandma. So we had to pull back on that a little bit. Um, uh, and they moved the election date, which um, they pushed it back, which kind of screwed a lot of things up for us in our budget. Um, but then also in the final weeks, you had a, a super PAC come in that was, um, I, I'm fairly certain, directed by Kevin McCarthy um, that just kind of trashed me with a lot of negative ads, uh, labeling me a never Trumper, which I'd always figured I was kind of a sometimes Trumper. You know, when he's right, he's right. When he's wrong, he's wrong. I thought the irony of the attacks, though, were that I, I, I was fairly certain it was a neoconservative attack against me because I actually was somewhat in alignment with Donald Trump on the foreign policy goals of getting out of these foreign wars. Um, but they did attacks, you know, pulling things I'd said when uh, I was Rand Paul's state chair in the primary and things got nasty uh, between them. And um, yeah, and they, they managed to smear me. I mean, good. but it really shows like, uh, you know, particularly, I mean, Freedom Works is no longer, but I mean, in 2020 and certainly the Club for Growth, if you're trying to appeal to, um, you know, Republican economic conservatives, it's like, okay, that's, you've been, your ticket's been punched twice. Yeah. Yeah, it was a disappointing finish. And it really was a moment that made me kind of take a step back and evaluate. And it was nice to head off to Texas and work with Young Americans for Liberty for a while and kind of figure things out a bit. But, um, but you know, it was a, it was a really freak year, <laughs> but 2020 was. Do you, um, and you're, you're not super optimistic about national politics, but at the state level, do you think, and you know, in, by you know, the, the next general election in 2028, will, will we be in a better place as a, as a country? I think on the state level, we will be. That's where I think real change is gonna happen in, in, a, in the direction of liberty. Um, and uh, it's gonna be one, I mean, the further kind of advancement of school choice policy around the country uh, I, I imagine it won't be too long until the first state actually passes Defend the Guard. And then I think you're going to see, uh, once that dam breaks, you're going to see that happening all, in many states across the country. And that would be interesting to see if that actually exerts a kind of upward pressure or a pressure from below on foreign policy. Right? Yeah, 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 it, it would. It would be, um, it would certainly put the federal government in a, in, a, in a difficult position where they have to try to um, retaliate against states for, for not falling in line with these unconstitutional policies, or the president has to go to Congress and ask them to vote on the wars, yeah. which... Um, I can't imagine. There'll be a lot of vacancies that day, right? Like I couldn't get into the office that day. Um, how long is your term as uh, head of the Free State Project for? Um, there's no specific okay. time period on it. So let's say, you know, it, four years from now, when 2028 is rolling around, how will we know that you've been successful as the head of the Free State Project? Well, we'll have more and more people who love liberty in the state of New Hampshire. We're going to build a stronger and stronger community. Uh, there will be more and more. You now, um, the Free State Project doesn't uh, get directly involved in elections because we're a 501c3, but mm -hmm. the fruits of the movement will be seen. You will see more libertarians in the legislature. You will see more liberty policy being enacted. You will see uh, uh, New Hampshire really being the lighthouse for liberty in America. And maybe one day you'll even see like Bernie Sanders is the mascot for socialist Vermont. <laughs> maybe one day we'll actually have like a libertarian uh, U.S. senator from, from New Hampshire. Good. All right. Well, Eric Brakey, thanks for talking to Reason. Pleasure's on mine, Nick.